Uh, welcome everyone to the Summer STEM Career Accelerator, our, our Thursday uh, discussion on climate resilience. So I wanted to share with everyone joining today that uh, this, if you're coming in as part of a student in our, in our session, or if this is the first uh, day you're joining us, uh, today we're going to be talking about climate resilience. We have a lot of great speakers lined up for the summer, so you can join us on Thursdays to learn about digital health, robotics, semiconductors, and uh, aviation. Same time every Thursday. Um, and then you can also see all of the past discussions that we've had uh, on our YouTube channel. So everything will be recorded and you'll be able to go back and listen again or share it with friends uh, and anyone you think might be interested in, in hearing. Um, you can also find all of our past panelists on our, our channel. Um, by the end of the summer, they'll all be tagged on a project page for the, the program, the two, two, 2022 summer program, along with all of you. So you'll always sort of be connected uh, through, together by, by coming and joining us today. Through that page. Uh, students, if you're joining us for the first time today, again, it's not too late to join our summer program. This is really only the first week and the sessions are recorded, so you can do them at your own pace. Um, you can go to any of our social channels and check out the calendar of events and get excited about what we have in store for you this summer. And now I'm going to actually turn it over to Moe's who is a great supporter of youth, of students, of promoting diversity in STEM fields. And he's also a supporter of Repicture, and he is the one who's lined up this incredible speaker for you today. So I'm gonna turn it over to Moe's actually to introduce our speaker. And then, uh, and then our moderator, Jerry, will, will, um, will ask questions. Hello everyone, uh, I have the pleasure to be with you here today and introduce you uh, a dear friend and uh, one of the leader basically with a long history in encouraging uh, investment in environmental, economical and social impact. Uh, Taj Al Dirigi, uh, Taj Ahmed Al Dirigi, with over 25 years of investment professional. Uh, his career included executive role in banking, asset management, and alternative investment and entrepreneurship. Uh, he's a general partner that includes venture partners, uh, formal senior director uh, of investment at the Los Angeles Clean Tech Incubator, uh, where he established um, in the Impact Fund One and the Debt Fund. In addition, uh, Al-Dirigi created programs such as uh, LASI Investor Talk and LASI Investor in Resident Program and the Investor Impact Summit Series with JP Morgan Chase. Uh, he has been named uh, one of 53 investors to watch in 2021 by Pitchbook and 101 Black Titan in Tech. He also served on the Climate Finance Advisory Team of the Community Investment Guarantee Pool El Dirigi has a bachelor degree in poetry and literature, uh, literature from Texas and A&M University, uh, an MBA degree in international business from Pepperdine University, and he has a PhD in geopolitical and economic and economic from Claremont uh, Graduate University. He also studied abroad, and he studied included uh, countries like Chile, Portugal, and Hong Kong. Uh, he loved poetry, and in terms of his love of poetry, he loved music of all genre. Um, without uh, further ado, I'm going to hand it to Jerry to, uh, um, to interview our guest today. Thank you, Lois, and welcome, Taj. Um, thank you for that wonderful introduction. Um, I think I wanted to get started with... Um, the first question here is, can you explain your career journey, such as your education or your first job that led you to this field? Um, I know Mose gave a very uh, like pretty detailed um, background of what you've done, and done, it seems like you've done a lot of different things, so um, I'd love to hear about that. Yeah, well, Jerry, thank you so much, and Repitcher, thank you so much for having me. I'm looking forward to this conversation. Um, in, in regards to your question, one of the things I, I think I think about is we often talk about diversity, and, and a lot of times we talk about diversity in a sense of race and gender, 
but we failed to mention there's another type of diversity too, which is called intellectual diversity, which which when you bring other types of, of, of thoughts in, uh, I'm a son of immigrants. My father's from from Sudan. My mother's from Dominican Republic. Um, so with, if you if you're the children of any immigrants, you know the the desires for you to be a doctor or a doctor. Uh, but I was rebellious and and I wanted to be in music, um, and that, which which is what led me into the areas of poetry and literature. Needless to say, when I graduated from undergraduate degree, I did not put an album out. I wasn't as lucky as Beyonce or Drake. Uh, but what I did do, I was working at a bank uh, during that time to support myself during college. And I realized that at the end of the day, there is some connectivity to, to language, to literature and, and banking. At the end of the day, people buy products and services based on stories. And, and a great storyteller is one that can have a, to be a great salesperson. And that's one of the things I learned early on is how to, how to really weave great stories into the products. Uh, one of the features I've always talked about is, is you know, um, features tell of benefit sale. And, and I learned that early on in, in banking. Um, and, and so began my career uh, working in the banking industry uh, right after graduation. Um, I actually started out with Wells Fargo Bank uh, working inside a grocery store. Back in the early 90s, they had banking inside of a grocery store. And I did it because uh, I, I, you know, never coming into the financial industry, I, I didn't see anything wrong with it. Uh, but it was a really great push because it was something that banks were trying. It was something new. A lot of the existing bankers would, did not really want to do it because they saw it as a step down. Whereas me coming into the industry new, I didn't, I didn't know anything about it. And so for me, it was a, it was a great kind of, kind of push. And I spent a number of years there before going into corporate banking and subsequently joining other firms such as UBS in investment roles. Um, and, and that really kind of benefited me when I became a founder um, and because I have this, this financial background in addition to this language background that I mentioned, um, and that really kind of carried me on as an investor and advisor in different roles. And I think the way I got into climate and the way that really interests me in climate is I used to be in the apparel industry. And, and you know, when I learned when I learned there was that there was a lot of waste in apparel. And that was really the first time that my eyes were open to climate my eyes were open to a lot of the waste that we have in that industry. And that started me on the path to really kind of focusing on climate and investing in climate as well. Awesome, thank you. Uh, that actually leads me into my next question of um, what does a career look like um, or what does a career in climate resilience look like? Because that um, comes in many different forms. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm, I'm so excited. I, I think a number of years ago, uh, more more than a decade ago, was the first iteration of what I call Climate 2 1.0, where you had a lot of firms kind of going into the space. It was very esoteric. It was really dependent on the federal government. And there was a lot of failure. So a lot of investors moved back, which is why we didn't really see a lot more interest in it. Um, but I think now what I'm really excited about and proud about is, is the younger generation is really kind of pushing a lot of firms to be more sustainable. They're requesting sustainable products. And so that's making both the existing firms think about their sustainability as well as new opportunities and new technologies that are coming in. I think with being climate resistance or climate having a climate resilience focus is really kind of focusing on products to service that reduce. Um, having a climate resilient focus is one that really kind of reduces the the impacts of climate change for our communities. And and one of the things I've I've, I've said often is that you know when we talk about climate change, climate change is more than just caring for the animals, caring for the planet. Climate change and, and caring about that and focus on sustainability is really a public health issue because there are many diseases that are impacted by our climate. I'm, I'm, I'm living proof of that. It's an opportunity to really kind of create a new type of jobs that are out there. Uh, and the last piece is a social justice issue because there are a lot of communities that have been historically impacted by climate. And that's an opportunity to really kind of create the solutions to, 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 to bring that in. So I would say that in, out of all careers, I think climate careers not only provide you with a, with a, with a, with an economic wage and benefit, but you can also feel good about what you're doing because you're having huge impact in, in not only your communities, but many other communities as well. Awesome. Thank you. Um, moving on to our next question. Um, how has this field or how has your career helped you grow or how have you grown with this field? Uh, no, good question. So um, I, I think I've grown a lot from a standpoint of understanding a lot of the impacts 
for climate. As I mentioned, when I first got into the space, I was only interested in how consumer products were were, were sustainable or could be sustainable because I came into it from a standpoint of, of apparel. Uh, but as time went on, I began to start seeing other things and like transportation has been hugely popular. And one of the things I'm really interested in, and, and when we talk about transportation, it's not just the vehicles that we're driving or electric vehicles, but it's also how electric vehicles are are, are fueled. Um, so EVSCs or charging stations and everything around that has been really interesting to me. Um, the, the fact that a lot of things are being electrified, whether those are airplanes and our, our buses or our, our, our logistics trucks. And so I think as time has gone on, it's expanded my ideas of what's sustainable. It's allowed me as, a, as an individual to know what type of things I can do to be an impact on the climate side. And it's also increased my, my investment opportunities and the types of companies that we want to see that are, that are important for that as well. Awesome, that's great to hear. Um, and as an investor uh, that recently raised $250 million um, investment fund, I imagine you get to see a lot of like very new and emerging technologies that come to the market. Um, so what do you think of these careers um, in the future? Like, what do you think those will look like? And how do you think um, students or um, anyone for that matter, um, looking into these new careers um, coming online that never existed before? Yeah, uh, well, thank you for that. We're, we're actually still raising, so we've we're got, a, got a ways to go to the 250, but definitely it's been really interesting to see. And yes, we, we reviewed over 130 different new technologies on the climate side. So I would say there are a lot of opportunities coming out. And even though if I put my economics hat on, we're, we're headed into what I kind of call a mini recession, I think climate is going to be one of the areas of, of sectors that's not going to be as impacted uh, for that because there's a lot of interest in it. Uh, just from a standpoint of, like I mentioned, on, on, on the transportation side, you have a lot of pain that's at the pump currently, and you have a lot of people who are really kind of thinking about buying electric vehicles. And so not only that you're seeing opportunities to do in that space, but like, for example, one of the other uh, companies I'm invested in is a company that's focused on changing the way that we buy vehicles and how we finance electric vehicles as well. And so I think that that's really exciting. I think for students now, you're going to start seeing a lot of programs um, that are tar targeting sustainability. They're targeting taking your talent, whether that whether you're um, a STEM major or even if you are a uh, um, social sciences major into the space. And you'll start seeing a lot of opportunities, both for new companies that are set up, startup companies that are net new, as well as existing companies. Because again, a lot of the existing companies are really kind of focusing on climate resilience and changing the way they do business and offering opportunities for employment in that space. Awesome. Yeah, I think there's like a lot of different things that you can do with um, this new and emerging field. Um, I would say moving on to our next question, what advice um, do you have for building a professional network, um, uh, maybe going into this field, whether you're in high school or college or um, an emerging young professional? Yeah, great question, uh, uh, Jerry. So what I, would, what I would say is twofold, really threefold, I would say. Number one, uh, study, 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 really kind of broaden your horizon about what's out there on a the sustainability front. Um, really kind of study a lot of things that are, that are out there, whether it's focused on solar, whether it's focused on transportation, whether it's focused on food innovation, really kind of have a broad list of, of areas that you're focused on. Um, and, then, and then also too, one of the things that I love is even though we're in a pandemic and all of us are being impacted by it, we're all at, at home or at various places and we're communicating very online. But I think the good thing about that is that that's gonna democratize access to information. So now you can you can join a meeting in Brussels without even have to pay for a trip to, to overseas and really participate in what's happening in the conversations there. The other thing I would say too, I think for students is that this problem that we're talking about in climate resiliency is a global issue. So that gives you an opportunity to really kind of travel and expand your horizons. As Mo's mentioned, I studied abroad in China, Portugal, and, and Chile. And, and I did that because I kind of figured that there's going to be some interconnect, interconnecting it with business. And I initially thought it was going to be on the finance side, but I'm seeing that it's not only finance, but also climate that we're seeing the interconnectivity to it. Um, and then lastly, one of the things I would say too, is one of the things I did when I was younger is, is definitely uh, follow some folks who are top voices in the space, you know, learn what the things that they're talking about. 
uh, research some of those things that are talking about as well. And I think that will be very beneficial because it can give you an opportunity to have those conversations. Um, and then lastly, what I would say too, is that there are a lot of opportunities that are out there. Um, don't be afraid to, to, to you know, work with a startup company. Don't be afraid to work with a new companies in this space, because I think you're going to have a lot of new technologies that are coming that are really exciting to try to focus on sustainability and climate resiliency. Awesome. That's great to hear. Very encouraging. Yeah. Um, uh, also, another question I have would be, how do you feel that this field um, helps people as well? Oh, absolutely. So I, I kind of touched on it briefly about the public health issues with, with climate. Um, you know, about five years ago, I got diagnosed with a kidney disease that, that caused me to have kidney failure. And we realized that the kidney failure came from where I grew up in Dallas, Texas. And we had some, some lead poisoning in the ground that subsequently entered our, our bodies. And two of my relatives already passed from kidney failure. And I was lucky enough to find out about it before it, it, it progressed. Uh, but we realized that, that that kidney failure was caused by environmental factors. And so I think about, you know, a lot of the technology that we're talking about, a lot of the, the things that really kind of reduce a lot of waste in our society can really save lives. And I think that's what's really exciting for me about what we're doing in this space is not only are we, we're, we're living and working in a, in, a, in a field that's making us money to have a living wage, but it also can save some people and it can save someone else. And so that's for me what I get so excited about when I start thinking about the investments that we're making or the opportunities for, for employment in this space. And, and, and I'll say this also too, because, because climate is not as impacted as others, or I think won't be as impacted as others during this downturn, that's gonna leave a lot of opportunities for employment opportunities. And what I'm excited about is that, unlike the traditional areas of tech where everything's really kind of centered in Silicon Valley, I think you're gonna have a lot of companies that are in different areas uh, in Texas and Alabama and Mississippi and Florida, um, outside of the traditional Bay, they're still in the tech space, still in the sustainability space that will allow people to really kind of live anywhere where you want to, um, in addition to this, this idea of remote work is happening now. So I think those two things are what excites me a lot about the industry um, is the fact that you can save, save people by the work that we're doing. And then number two, it, it's going to be decentralized and where we can work and what we can do. Awesome. That's wonderful. Um, another question that I'd like to ask you is um, what is the most unusual or maybe the most interesting project that you've um, been able to work on? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, because we, you know, I, I as you mentioned, we, we see a lot of technologies that are really interesting. Um, I see a number of them in the climate space, uh, whether it's it's taking energy from pipes and water, uh, but but our, our electric airplanes that are that are really interesting for me. But one of the ones I think that are really really cool is this is company, and we have not invested in it. They're they're actually not taking venture funding, so they're in a really good space. But I just think it's a really cool technology. If you've ever worn leather. Um, there are there are a couple different ways. I mean, it's an animal product, and, and the reason that you're seeing a lot of push for non-animal products, whether it's food or clothing, is because a lot of greenhouse gas emissions that are that are created in the production of various products. And there's a company that's creating le leather out of cactus, which is really interesting, and, and it's a lower water use rate for it as well. Um, and then there's another company also creating a leather type leather type product out of mushrooms in Europe. And so those two are really interesting to me, given my previous fashion background and apparel background. Uh, but I'm really I get really excited when I see different type of products that are being made um, that that are out there. Uh, another thing I would say too is that I'm I'm really excited at a lot of the plant based products that are happening and people are getting involved in it. There's a there's a brand in Atlanta called Slutty Vegan that's really popular that's that I think is is just phenomenal um, that that's talking about you know plant based burgers and then uh, people like Drake and uh, Kevin Hart are getting into the plant based space as well here in Los Angeles and so I think those are things that are really exciting um, and you'll you'll probably see more of them as well. Awesome, that's really cool. I never would have thought they could make like uh, leather out of cactus or cacti. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that's cool. Um, so I'm going to, before I move into our um, lightning round, I wanted to give people the opportunity to just, if you have questions, put them, you can put them in the chat um, and we can go into those in a little bit. And then also I wanted to open the floor to, um, I believe one of the peer mentors wanted to ask a question as well. Um, 
if uh, just let me know in the chat when you're ready to ask and, and we can move to that question as well. So I think that's a really a good question to ask. Um, so moving to like our lightning round sort of, um, what skills have you used the most um, so far in the industry? Yeah, well, I'll be, I'll be honest, you know, I, I think, I, and I started by saying I was a, I was a portrait major degree um, and I said communication and storytelling was vastly important and it is, but you also have to have a base, a financial base. And I think going and getting my MBA uh, really helped uh, because you want to be able to really assess the viability of companies as an investor, you want to assess the viability. And, and, and I think that's part of it. You know, when we make decisions on investments, we look at three areas. We look at the, the team or the person um, that's really subjective. Then you look at the company and the product and what they're building. And then lastly, you look at um, you know, the industry that they're in as well. And so I think uh, that financial capacity of really pen, being able to assess uh, financial returns and, and read financial statements has been very beneficial for me uh, in the work that I'm doing. I, I think in regards to the climate focus and climate resiliency, it just really depends on the sector that you're in. So if you're in solar, you're in food, you're in transportation, you know, I, I think having a deep understanding of that market and understanding of the technologies there is going to be important to, to really kind of move forward in, in the career path in that space. If I would provide some advice for individuals who are going to the spaces, well, it just depends on the area that you're in. I think the good thing about climate resiliency is that it's going to encompass a lot of different areas. It may encompass you know, working in an existing firm and their finance department to really kind of think about ways to to, to re reduce a lot of their waste. They may be in a facilities department. So I think the opportunity with climate resiliency is very broad and that's a good thing because it'll allow a lot of different people to enter the workforce. Awesome, that's perfect. Um, and then we'll open up the floor to Michael. Uh, we had a question for you. Um, thank you. Uh, yeah, so I had a question about branding, and I thought I would ask this because this week we kind of did a little um, a little talk about what it means to like have your own personal brand. Yeah. So I was wondering, uh, have you thought about your own brand, and do you have advice for others about how to build your brand? Yeah, a uh, great question. I'm, I'm a very visual person, and you can see either from this picture here or my my static picture. I have, a, I have a brand, I think. Um, I, I, I do think that that's important to, to do so, especially in this time. I think for me as an, as an investor, it's very important to have a brand because um, there's a lot of funds that are popping up and you want to make sure that you're, you're, you're being seen similar to the products. But I think in regards to climate resiliency, the, the way to build brands is, is really being a subject matter expert. Um, and you're building a brand of knowledge. Um, and I think now you have tools like Medium and tools like LinkedIn that allow you to really kind of pontificate on a certain different topics. And I think that's that's really important to it. So I, I definitely think building a brand is important. The type of brand you build, whether it's a visual brand or, or a brand that's really kind of steeped in being an SME, a subject matter expert, is really important. And it will separate you. And, 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 I, and I tell not only my, my own, my own uh, people I've mentored in the past, we've talked about building their own brands, but I think it's really important to do so uh, because it'll separate you from others that are out there in the market. Awesome, thank you. I think that's really helpful when creating a personal, your personal brand. Um, okay, we have a question in the chat. Yeah. Um, says, what would you say is the biggest challenge, if any, towards innovation and climate resilience? Yeah, you know, we we would talked about this early. I had a meeting this morning at 6 a.m. and we had this exact same question. I think it's really twofold. The first challenge is in, ensuring that, you know, I'll be honest, there are some people who don't believe we have climate issues and who are who don't believe that we need to even focus on climate resiliency. And so the first challenge is really ensuring that we're having a community of voices that are that are like the coalition of the willing. And I think the way to do that is that we we have to talk about climate resiliency in a way that resonates with everyone. Um, and make it very organic. So I, I, I truly believe that if I'm talking to a person on the West Coast, I'm talking very differently about climate as opposed to when I'm talking to somebody back at home in Texas. And I think that's what we have to do. We have to really kind of augment our language and the way we talk about it to make sure that people can see that there are benefits in it. I think the other thing about that too, when we talk about it is that for so long, um, we talked about climate in a, in a form of negativity. We talked about the, the you know, the, the, 
the detriments that's happening, the doom and the gloom. And I think we need to talk about the opportunities that may be abound with with climate. Um, and, and I think, you know, we I'll give you a perfect example. You know, there, there are individuals who may work in the coal industry in, in the southeast and north the Northeast and they've done it for a number of years. They have family in the space and they don't understand how this new type of technology is coming in. And, and it's initially creating losses in the community from job losses as opposed to opportunities. And so you have to, so you have to think about it in a standpoint and communicate it in a way to where they can see how it benefits them um, or, or how it's going to benefit them in, in the future. And I think the second challenge to it as well is that um, not all technologies will work. I think that's the reality that we have to say is that there are some technologies that are net new coming out that may not get the goals that we need. Um, and that's the risk of being in technology, early stage technology. And, and, and typically when I talk about climate resiliency, I talk about it from a standpoint of early technology that's still being trying to be proven. And then technology that's been proven that some of the, the, the later stage companies or, or older companies are taking advantage of and utilizing. And so, I'll, you know, I think those are two of the challenges that we have to overcome if we want to move forward on the climate side. Wonderful, wonderful. So um, I'll take the question from the person with the raised hand, Abdallah, if you'd like to uh, unmute yourself or you can type it in the chat, whichever works for you. Uh, yes, I would like to so, uh, good afternoon, uh, Mr. Eltridge. It's a pleasure being here, and I thank you for coming to introduce us to the climate change industry regarding the STEM field. I have one question that's been on my mind. It, it kind of affects all fields, but I find it especially prominent in the climate era. Uh, and it's kind of how do we deal with, I had to say, political pressure regarding fields, especially like climate, because there have been a lot of good inventions like electric vehicles or whatnot, but I found they often get abused for political gain. Uh, yeah. You know, like overly pushing things like with this, the rapid digitalization of many cars, it's caused a semiconductor shortage and a, a rapid need for lithium that's caused a lot of yeah. you know, human rights violations in areas like where me and you come from. You said your parents are from Senegal. And I'm personally, my family's from Egypt. As a company, you know, what's the protocol for that? Do you work around it politically? Do you try to technologically go around it? How do we manage it? And what are some ideas we can implement in the future to minimize this otherwise harmful practice that has often been present in politics since the beginning of its existence? Yeah, great, great question. And that's one of the biggest debates in transportation is whether or not we do hydrogen fuel vehicles or electric vehicles and, and, and the impact of, of lithium mining. I mean, that's why you're, you're seeing things like Lithium Valley and Riverside County to really kind of reduce a lot of the need for, for internalization of, of, of batteries and battery technology. But yeah, I, I think those are some of the, 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 the major questions we're having. As an economist, I'll put my economics hat on. One of the things I've always said is that we have to find the, the, the lowest cost of, of impact um, because I think that any decision we make, there's gonna be some unintended consequences. And I give you a perfect example of a low hanging fruit. You know, there was, there was a time when, when people decided to remove plastic bags from grocery stores in an effort to be more sustainable and encourage people to bring in their, their cloth bags. Uh, but we didn't realize that a lot of, and, and again, they, they label the, the, the plastic bags as single use, not realizing that there are a number of communities they use those bags for more than single use, whether those bags are used for, for hair caps in the showers, whether those bags are used for picking up dog poop, whether dog, those bags are used for, for trash cans, for trash bins, or many other things as well, um, cooking. Um, so I, I think that those are, and we've seen with that, with the unintended consequences of the single use plastic products that we had to go back to the drawing board. I think that we are gonna have some unintended consequences with a lot of the technologies that we're developing, but I think that that's, the, 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 the idea though for me is that how can we continue to reiterate? How can we continue to improve and ensure that we're having new technologies? Right now, there are some companies that are building new types of batteries that use less lithium um, as a response to some of the issues that we had around just traditional pre-plug lithium batteries. But I think on the political side that, you know, like, like, like the most mentioned, my, my PhD is in geopolitical economics. There's always gonna be politics around any decision that a person makes. Um, and I think that's a good thing because we need healthy debates. Um, and I think that that's, that's gonna be around for forever um, for, for what we have. 
Um, so I think the the solution to that is is to always have a robust technology system that's always trying to build something better um, than what's already existing out there, even if it's electric vehicles. Because uh, the idea with electric vehicles was they were trying to build something better than ICEs. And now we, we need to have some type of technology that could build something even better than a lot of the issues that we found in, in electric vehicles. So good question. Thank you for that. I see. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Taj. Thank you um, for asking your question. Um, I'm going to sort of skip around with the questions that we have, since I think this one is slightly similar to the, this question that we just heard. But um, this question from Josh, Joshua that says, do you believe that political action or public involvement is needed now for climate activism to produce effective solutions? Yeah, I think it has to be. I, I think the issue that we got into years ago was relying too much on political activism and, and the government, I should say. I think right now what, what we need a lot of a lot more of is practical use and, and people to realize that the use of, of, of sustainable practices can benefit them both from a health standpoint and an economic standpoint and a social justice standpoint. And so I think that that's one of the things we're going to see a lot more of um, is 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 opportunities to, to kind of get into this space, um, but also too. It, it's going to it's going to take kind of a, 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 a combination of not just you know, desire, but also political action. But I think it can't just solely be political action to move it. It has to be things that a person says make sense for me to use. Um, so I think that's gonna be kind of the, the, the lead way for that. Awesome, thank you. Um, and then two questions that are relatively similar of um, one asked by Asai um, of are there are there any innovative or interesting ideas right now that you believe will lead the forefront of climate resilience? And the second question that is related is if I'm interested in working for a startup, what is the best way to find out about those opportunities? Yeah, yeah, great question. I saw I saw Mr. Song's question earlier. So that's that's really interesting. I think there are a number of different organizations that are popping up to to enable the workforce to really kind of get into uh, climate resiliency. There's an organization called JFF in DC that's really doing something on the climate resilience space that I'm really excited about. Uh, there's a site called Climate Works um, that's really that lists a number of, of job opportunities in the climate space um, from a tech standpoint. Then, of course, there are organizations like like um, that are out there from Going VC and others that that list uh, a lot of opportunities. Another thing I would say too is that as an investor, a lot of funds really kind of post a lot of opportunities that they're hiring for um, uh, on their portfolio. So, for example, if we invest in a company, we want to see kind of the best and the brightest because that really impacts our returns. So, you'll see a lot of opportunities there. Uh, but I, but I think that the good thing about it is you're going to see more and more things pop up. Um, that are focusing on job creation in the space in many different different areas. And I think that's going to be really interesting on it. Uh, and I'm sorry, Jerry, what was your second question? Because I asked the first one, the second one first. What was the first question? Uh, the first question is, if I'm interested in working first, oh wait, which one did yeah. I ask first? Is that one? No, it was the second one. Oh, it was, the no. second one, okay. Um, are there any innovative or interesting ideas right now that you believe will leave the forefront of climate resilience? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I you know, I, I think uh, I can't remember who asked the question about the political activism, but I, I think that for me, the low hanging fruit is going to be the things that that people can really wrap their heads around and, and really, um, really, really understand. Uh, I think there are a lot of areas in sustainability, like carbon capture, that are a little esoteric and don't really impact a, a person on a day to day basis that they don't see. But I, but you know when you walk into a local store like Kohl's and they're really highlighting a lot of the the, the climate neutral products that they have in the store, I think that's going to be really impactful. So you're going to start seeing it on the consumer product side first, I think, and that's going to be really exciting. Um, and then I start, and then I think you're going to see a lot more on the food innovation side, whether that's the type of food that we're eating, whether that's a reduction of us uh, consuming more meat-based products and going to more plant-based products. And so I think definitely the CPG and food innovation side, you're going to see a lot more innovation there. And, uh, and that's where we're going to be a lot more exciting for the, for the mass public. Awesome. Thank you. Um, another question that we have in the chat is, will the actions we take today be enough to forestall the direct impacts of climate change or is it too late? Yeah, there was there was a report that came out that was basically saying that, that we are a little too late. Um, I, I'm, I'm probably 
uh, one of the more optimistic uh, economists, and I believe that you know anything that we can do can can save a little bit a little bit more. And, and I also, for me, I look at climate change a little bit differently than a lot of my colleagues. I think a lot of my colleagues look at climate change and environmentalism from a global macro standpoint about how it impacts the world as as a whole. And I look at it from that standpoint, but also how it impacts the individual. And I'm gonna give you a perfect example. You know, there are a number, we, we could probably raise the hands of how many of us know people who have asthma, who grew up in, in major urban areas that have off ramps to, to, um, to uh, highways and things of that nature. And a lot of those, a lot of the things that's been talking about uh, that being, uh, you know, from, from the vehicles that we've been driving that, with their emissions, um, I, I have a house in Riverside County, which which has a huge amount of logistics companies and, and Amazon, and a lot of things that just been growing um, from from the from the from us being at home ordering online and the use of a lot of people ordering online as well. But we're also seeing how prevalent a lot of the people there, our children included, who have eczema, which is a skin disease that has been caused by a lot of the particulates in the environment as well as as, as asthma. And so I, I, I really kind of push back on and, and I feel like there's an opportunity to talk about our focus on environmentalism, our focus on a, and climate change, clean tech, uh, that can have some immediate impacts on the health of our community. Um, I, I talk about food innovation and, and the fact of, of a lot of the reduction of meat has been primarily because of the reduction of greenhouse gas emissions that come with creating meat-based products. But we can also see the immediate health help uh, impacts of that as well as people switch to a more plant-based diet or, or what we kind of call flexitarians, which is uh, a little bit more heavier on the plants and vegetables versus uh, meats, uh, animal organs and things of that nature. So I, I look at it from that standpoint um, that, it's, that it's more of a micro impact than a macro impact. Um, from a macro impact and how it impact the world, I mean, I, I'll be honest, I, I, don't, I think that there's some still desire to do it. But I think that it has to be not just us as individuals doing what we do to, to reduce a lot of the greenhouse gas emissions, but it has to be the corporations. And we can drive those corporations by really kind of desiring the type of products that, that don't produce uh, emissions. Awesome. Thank you, Taj. And thank you for all of y'all's questions. Um, I see another question in the chat says, I appreciate your reasoning on understanding how the definition of environment may change based on where we are. So how can we find middle ground when discussing these issues? How can we embrace climate resilience while also continuing to embrace technological advancements? And what measurements are taken to test new climate-friendly innovations and their success or satisfaction rate? Yeah, great, great question. I think the first piece of that is how can we I think, you know, this is, we talk a lot, we, you hear the conversation a lot about diversity. And again, I, I mentioned this idea about not just race and gender, but also geographic intellectual diversity. I think that comes into play because you have to have conversations around. If you're in California, your idea of, of climate resilience, I think is gonna be very different from someone say in New Orleans. And, but I think that there are technologies that can impact both. And so I think having more conversations and having more of a wider conversation with people who are, who are in different areas, where we kind of help in that space. Um, and I think on the success side, at least for us, there are certain tools that are out there. For example, as we invest, there's a tool called the crane tool that we can use to determine whether or not the investments that we're making uh, are, are something that's really producing reduction of greenhouse gas emissions or water savings. Um, and there are more tools that are coming to market out there as well to really kind of determine the investments that you're making with it, with it, with it, with it connect. Um, there are a lot of companies when they're when they're talking about their impact to avoid this idea of greenwashing, which is just saying you're you're sustainable or you're providing a, a green look without doing it. There are companies that are, that are coming up with ways to really kind of showcase that they are, um, in fact, uh, truly benefiting the environment. Um, and so there, there are tools that are out there that are really kind of assessed to show the success of those products in the market. Awesome. Thank you for your answer. Um, another, so I know that you've been um, uh, talking about how um, there's a lot of different like aspects of what diversity is um, and you um, care about and support like diverse founders. So how do you, um, how do you create spaces that invite those diverse founders to tap into these different um, funding opportunities that you're creating and how do you, um, 
How do you build a diverse and supportive ecosystem for startups in like clean tech? Yeah, great question. I, I think there's an old adage I, I hear often time is that sometimes you can't be what you can't see. And so there needs to be people that's in the space that you can look to and say that, you know, they've done it. Um, I can do it. I can see myself in that space. And you also have to be welcoming as well. Um, one of the things that we've done in my firm is we, we definitely, you know, have people come as they are. Um, and really kind of embrace a lot of differences within within our companies and within our team members. And I think we encourage our, our firms to do the same and the funds we work with to do the same. Um, I, I think that culture matters. And I think that we're going to see that if we if we really kind of embrace that, it'll be, it'll be very important. Um, one of the things I want to highlight is that, you know, we with, with the advent what happened with George Floyd, we started seeing a really, uh, I guess, a recognizing of race in this country of looking to, to see a lot of the mishaps that's been having to certain individuals, whether African-Americans, Latinos, or Asian-Americans or immigrants. Um, and, and now we're seeing that kind of fall back where a lot of the funding for those organizations that are led by people of color are drying up. And, and so I think that there's an opportunity for us to really kind of move forward with this and, and, to, and, to, and to invest in these companies that are led by women and people of color on uh, there in different areas. I think also too, in the tech sector, what I'm really excited about is that because of the pandemic, like I mentioned before, um, the the center of technology, I don't think it's going to be uh, San Francisco in the future. I think you're going to have different cities that are really kind of enticing people to move there because the cost of living is a little bit different, but they're moving there with their skills and their talent and sort of building companies in, in places like Mobile, Alabama, and Memphis, Tennessee, and Atlanta, Georgia. Um, and, and, and inherently, you're going to have diversity in some of those cities as well. And so I think that's going to be really exciting for the future of technology. Um, it's because you, you're, you have it where you don't have to always go to the Bay Area to make a really great living and to be really impactful in tech, um, but you can do it anywhere. And I think that's what excites me a lot. And that's what really kind of drives us to make the type of investments we do. So when we talk about uh, racial and gender diversity, again, one of the other things that we look into is geographic diversity and ensuring that we're really supporting companies that are making an impact in the communities that they're in. Awesome, that's great to hear. Um, and that's definitely something that uh, the industry will need a lot of different aspects of uh, what diversity is and um, upholding that so that other people who come later on have some others to look to. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah. Um, another question, um, what do you think, uh, or how big of an impact do you think uh, having more diversity in this field um, can have towards our progress with climate change? Yeah, I, I think having more diversity in this field does a few things. Number one, it, it gives us different tools to use um, and, it, and, it, and it allows us to think outside of the box of what's existing. Um, I, I, as I mentioned, when I talked about this idea of, uh, of, of single use plastic uh, paper bags, or uh, plastic bags, and how they were used by certain communities for a myriad of things. Um, I think, you know, I've seen situations where investors who typically uh, would invest in a lot of technologies don't, don't see a lot of the issues because they don't come from communities where this is an issue uh, for them. Um, I'll think about companies like there's a company called COI Energy that's really kind of focusing on energy as a service for, for people and, um, and reducing a lot of their energy, energy costs. Um, so I think that the, the diversity is really important because it allows us to really kind of think about new technologies and new solutions that may not impact you because you may not have that 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 uh, that problem, but somebody else does, and and they that that solution to that can impact not only them but anybody else that's in it. The other thing that I love about climate resiliency careers and jobs and technology is that this is a technology that's inherently created to impact not just the work the, the the community that it's from. But the global community. When we're solving the issue for climate, if we're just solving in California and not the rest of the U.S., we're not really solving the issue of climate. If we're solving the issue of climate in the U.S. and not the rest of the world, we're not solving the issue of climate. So inherently, this industry is really about internationalism and it's about co collaboration and coordination of efforts from many different areas. Uh, that's one of the reasons that probably about two months ago, we funded about 10 climate funds that are led by women and people of color. And we did seven in the US and seven in Europe. And we did that because we realized that we, we can't solve the climate crisis in the silo. We can't just solve it in one part of the world and, 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 and hope the rest of the world is okay. 
Uh, and I think that that's what diversity is about. Diversity is more than, than just that. It's a, it's a really about ensuring that we're having the, the feedback from others to come into the space to create those technologies and those solutions. Awesome, that's wonderful to hear. Uh, it looks like we do have another question in the chat um, from Joshua. How do you promote climate activism to people who don't believe it or don't care because they don't think it affects them um, in the here and now? Yeah, um, good question. And then he said, oh, says, or they said, uh, they say this because advocating to people who believe climate change isn't aiding the world right crisis. Yeah, I'll be honest. I was one of those people. I, I'll be honest. When when I when I was younger in my twenties and early thirties, you know, I I I looked at people who who were focused on environmentalism as you know, we derogatory terms, tree huggers, and all these other stuff, and. I didn't, I, I, there were so many issues that were impacting me personally at that time that I didn't see how can a person caring about ecological issues really provide me value. I was worried about income and all this sort of stuff. But that goes back to why I say that we have to talk about climate differently. Um, and, and, I, and I look at this idea of my background in poetry and literature and, into that. You know, we, we have to think about a different genre when we talk about climate. It can't always be about saving the world and saving the animals. They have, you have to make what people can see the benefit of climate for them from a different standpoint. I always talk about this idea of, of economics and, um, and, and public health because I think those are two major things that really kind of impact a number of people that could be impacted by climate. And so when I, when I talk about climate, I, I rarely try to, I try to understand what's a thing that's impacting that person or those group of people and then augment the conversation about climate towards that but i think the the main portion of that that we have to do that i think fail that a lot of people fail in climate activism is number one listening we rarely listen to people who don't agree with us and i think that's a problem we, we have to listen and we have to understand what some of the complaints that they have um, and then and then make sure that we're addressing that, because I think that there is an opportunity to, to do so. But I think that that's one of the things that we can do, both from an activism standpoint and a technology investing standpoint, when we're talking about climate, is really kind of sit and listen and hear about some of their issues, hear about some of the things that's important to them, and, and then see how climate can really be impactful there. Um, and, I, and I think that is something that needs to be done a lot more in our space to really get a lot more people behind the, the climate revolution or the, or the trans, transportation. I think unfortunate, the unfortunate thing about this, this war is that we have a war that's going on in, in, in Ukraine, um, but I think the gas prices and the increase in the gas prices and the fact that even with the reduction of the, of the tax on it, it's not going to do anything from a pricing standpoint. I think that's making people realize that there's, there, might, there should be alternatives to that type of vehicle uh, to go back and forth. And I think to, as the other person mentioned, we're gonna to come to the same reckoning with electric vehicles where we're gonna start seeing that we might need to think about different ways of, of, of assessing the, the ingredients for batteries outside of lithium that will have as much effect on certain environments that, that, that they're being mined from. And so I think that's one of the ways that you can kind of reduce a lot of the pushback and challenges of, of the activism when you talk about the climate, climate focus and the transformation of our energy sources. Awesome, thank you. That that um, reminds me sort of um, the reason that I got into transportation planning um, with in relation to sort of climate resilience and just public health um, is our reliance on um, uh, single user like vehicles or like um, personal vehicles and looking into um, public transportation and how that um, helps people uh, get from point A to B in a, in a different way than what we're used to. Um, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, just to um, sort of shift our uh, focus on your career, um, we also at Repicture want to show other sides of ourselves outside of what our career is. So I wanted to ask, um, like, what are your hobbies? Like, tell us about yourself, some fun facts about yourself. Yeah, that's why I think Michael was, that's why I asked him what instrument he played. I play saxophone. I'm a huge music fan. Um, you know, I, I've encouraged, I have three children and I encourage them to, to go into the arts. I think the arts are very important and sometimes we, we miss it. And I think the arts also could be impactful for STEM. I, even though my son plays piano and clarinet, uh, but he also has a science background as well. And I think that the his playment of those instruments really kind of impacted him from a scientific standpoint and really kind of uh, uh, 
provides value for that. Um, the, other, the other thing I love too is uh, I'm, I'm a really big fan of hats, but they're sustainable. So most people may see a lot of hats that I wear in pictures and, and panels, but um, a large majority of these hats are made out of waste material. Um, and I do that because that's a, another form of sustainability. Um, we're, we're, we no longer can ship our waste to, to abroad and we should not do that anyway. Um, so we have to think about ways to reuse and reduce our, our waste product and our, and our, and our fan, uh, landscape. And so I, I, I do like to support companies that are taking waste products and turning it into new products and reimagining those. There's another company in LA doing the same thing as well with, with all types of products and making um, uh, products out of them for clothing that I think is really awesome too. Um, called Rewilder, um, but I think that's that's what really gets me excited. But music is probably my my number one thing to like, and I listen to all genres from country music to bluegrass to R and B to hip hop to traditional North African music uh, to to bachata with my Afro Latino background. So yeah, I'm a huge music fan. Awesome, that's great to hear. I play the cello and the violin and the piano. Yeah. And someone asked, did you play tenor or alto um, sax? Alto sax, man, that's the only one. That's, that's <laughs> the, 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 the tenor is, uh, you know, no, I was going to say the soprano. I'm glad you didn't say the soprano because I'm going to say the soprano is too much like the clarinet. So no, I was a, I was an alto sax guy, but uh, my son betrayed me and plays the soprano. So that's why we were at odds. Awesome, Jim. Good, good, good. Sax players are awesome. We're cool. That's great. That's great. Um, so we also, so since we've been talking about like your personal brand and aligning with your personal brand, yeah. um, if you had to put your finger on the pulse of the industry, what is the culture of clean tech? Yeah, I, you know, somebody was asking about branding what what i decided that i wanted to do i wanted to make climate fun i wanted to make it cool i wanted to make it sexy when i first got in um, when i was working for university of california we first started in the wine industry and that's why that's right after getting into climate i was in wine and wine as many people know uses a lot of product uses a lot of water so it was one of the first ones that was impacted by climate and by the drought in this country in the state rather but um you know that that was one of the areas that really kind of got it got me involved and one of the one of the things the university said we wanted to make this this boring area of, of agriculture very sexy um very cool and and that's where i really kind of decided to it and, and i think you know uh, in, in the past like i mentioned you know, i've always felt like climate has been very antagonistic like if you disagree with somebody it was it was an environmentalism environmentalist there was a lot of arguments that can be had and what i want to bring into this space and what i've been trying to bring into this space is a sense of of listening to the other side even if you disagree because i think you can learn a lot from those disagreements and so i think that this this instance of not only making it cool but making it open to, to conversation and debate um, because i think that you know we we don't have the right answer. I think the answer is going to be ever evolving as evident from the conversation we had about electric vehicles and a problem that's inherent in electric vehicles that you rarely hear. And so for me, when I when I share information about climate, when I share information about sustainability, I try to, I try to share the good things that talk positively about the industry as well as the bad things that question it. And I, and I think that's important because we need to find the answers to those things that, that we have questions about. And it's great for those people to have questions because otherwise we'll get in the same issue that we're and now because people are afraid to speak up and i think that's important for this industry so if i would say one of the things we need in this industry as well we need very headstrong people that are thinking outside of the box that are willing to go against the status quo even if that status quo is unpopular and those are the type of people i love to support awesome thank you so much um so we have about four or so minutes left so i have two questions for you two last questions that we have for you um the first one being how have you changed your brand over time and at uh, different places in your career yeah um, and why and when and then the last question would be what would you like our program participants to know about you or to remember about you um after this talk yeah great questions thank you i appreciate it and number one we had a good time with talking with everyone so thank you for all the questions very informative and, and, and love it um, I think what's changed is I definitely think my look has changed when I first was got into the industry that was very clean shaven. 
uh, wore contacts. I felt like I had to be that way to compete to, to compete in corporate America. Uh, my father's Muslim. Uh, my father has a full beard. Um, and, and that's one of the visual things that I did once I became a, a founder myself and I was CEO of the company. I started making it and it was almost like it, there's a there's a law that just came out in California, which just it, it's been out called the Crown Act. And the Crown Act is really kind of talk about, especially for black women, hairstyles and natural hairstyles that are that are deemed professional. And, and I think it's the same thing for, for us as men where 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 beards uh, historically, I think, especially from people of color, have not been seen as 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 professional, so to speak. And I think that that that's something that that is that is changing now. Um, and, and I think that that has changed with the brand as well. And, and it, and it kind of comes across for me to to be uh, more so um, of really bringing your full self into the, into the picture because we need people's full self to really kind of solve these issues about things that, that come about. So I think that's been one of the things that's been changing um and uh for me as well and then i'm sorry jerry what was your last question uh the last question is what would you like our program participants to know about you um or at least remember about you after this talk oh yeah absolutely uh well number one i, I appreciate everyone for forward i think the one thing i would say is uh, for me i want people to think about is encourage debate is is don't just just go along with the status quo and think something is is the way it is because everybody else believes it you want to be differentiated i think this country we've had an issue of not listening to one side or the other and that's caused the problems that we have today whether that's from a climate standpoint or a political standpoint or whatever it, it may be so one of the thing i would say is listen with with with, with care with heart um have those conversations have those tough conversations and and be true to yourself I um, mean, that's how we're going to get out of the issue that we're in is really kind of a coming to, to consensus, uh, but also making sure we're listening to each other as we have these debates. And so that, if that's one thing I can I can relate to the students and your whole career, make sure you do that. Um, so that way we can we can have some of these great ideas come to fruition. Awesome. Well, thank you so, so much, Taj, for um, spending the past hour with us. Um, I've definitely learned a lot, and I'm, I think a lot of our participants have as well. Um, and again, thank you uh, so much um, for being our first panelist today. Right. Thank you all. And, and I hope, hope you do go into the, any of you go into the career of, uh, of climate resiliency, please. We need as many people as possible from various different backgrounds in the space as well. Uh, definitely, if you have any other questions out there, please feel free to connect with me on LinkedIn. Um, we're definitely interested. I, I try to mentor as many people as possible in the space. And uh, it's it's great to kind of see more new exciting faces in this in this space as well, especially those who have backgrounds that are non-traditional, like myself, who did not come from a business background, but ended up going to this space. Uh, we need you. We need those people in this space as well. So thank you.